Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, to this workshop on graduate study in the U.S. Why and how to apply. I am uh, Sun Hun Lee in the linguistics program. Uh, I teach linguistics courses and I also studied in the U.S. Uh, doing my PhD there. Uh, but uh, today we will have a guest speaker, uh, Professor Andres Kutzie from University of Michigan. Uh, who is going to share his experience as being part of the selection committee in the U.S. and uh, also who has been active in recruiting graduate students. So today's workshop will be about 30-35 minutes, 35 minutes of his uh, presentation and after that we wanted to give ample time for students to ask questions. Uh, if you don't for some reason have time to ask questions because of your other courses, just uh, I will, uh, in the middle of the talk, I will send everyone who registered here a Google form so you can use that Google form to ask questions and then I will uh, forward it to Dr. Kutzia so you can even ask questions afterwards. Does this sound good? Yeah, welcome and then let's have uh, Professor Kutzia. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. Um, yes, in addition to that way of asking questions, my email is also there and you should feel free to email me, you know, I hope I don't get a hundred email questions from 24 people, but I'm, you know, feel free to email me if you have questions about the application process. I will, I will answer them. If I get many, it might take a few days before I get to you. Okay, so yes, today I want to very briefly talk to you about the graduate system for the PhD study in the U.S., what it's like and how to apply. So this is a quick roadmap of what I want for us to cover today. So we'll begin with um, kind of like, should you apply to a U.S. graduate program? Yes or no? What are the things that you have to think about? We'll talk a little bit about the structure of the U.S. higher education system because it is sometimes quite different from systems you might be used to. And it helps if you can understand how the system you are used to maps onto the U.S. system, both when you think about whether you should apply and when you prepare your application. Then most of our time we will spend on the next section of what goes into an application, right? What do you have to do to apply? So first question, should you apply to do a PhD in the United States? Um, and I think this is really a very personal question. It's a question about what is right for you. So what you see on the screen here comes from the Times Higher Education, so they always rate all the universities in the world, and it just shows the top 200 universities in the world and how they are distributed. And you see that most are in Europe, that's simply because of the age of the European educational system. There's a very large number in the US, North America, and that's simply because it's such a big place, there's that many people. But there are universities in the top 200 throughout all of the world. And, you know, amongst Asian universities, there's 16 in Japan that's in that top 200 universities in the world. So what that means is you can get an excellent graduate education anywhere in the world. You don't have to go to the U.S. to get that, right? You can get it right here at home or in Africa or in Europe or anywhere in the world. That being said, there are reasons that I think makes the U.S. system kind of unique and good in many ways. So if these are things that matter to you, then the U.S. is a place that you can think about. The one is the size of the programs. So even in relatively small fields such as my own linguistics, Usually the PhD program has like 30 to 50 students in it. So every incoming year might be 6 to 10 students. And what that means is it immediately creates this critical mass of other people around you who have the same interest, treats the same things as you do, and creates this really vibrant intellectual community. And that's very different than the system in which I grew up, for instance, in South Africa, where graduate programs are small. They might be like, one PhD student every three years. So in the US you have this large cohort of other people and that makes it a very vibrant situation. US PhD programs are very international. So most PhD programs will have anywhere between 30 and 50% non-American students in them. So even if you're an international student there, you won't be alone. You won't be weird for being an international student. They also value US PhD programs if they can attract international students. So if you apply as an international student, that won't count against you. It might in fact count maybe even for you. Um, there's a very, very strong mentoring culture in the US. So different from, for instance, again, where I grew up in South Africa. 
you will work very, very closely with your advisor for the full five years that you're in the PhD program. And you might meet weekly with that person and that person will help you not just on developing your research but also just kind of general mentoring for how to engage with the academic world. So it's a very intense mentoring system that's part of the U.S. system that's different than what you will find in many other parts of the world. We'll talk more about funding. U.S. PhD programs have very good funding. Um, employability, I mean, you can get a good job with a good PhD from anywhere in the world. But if you have a U.S. PhD, your chances of getting a job, for instance, in the U.S. is better. And I think U.S. PhDs are also valued very well in the rest of the world. So your employability might be a little bit higher if you have a U.S. PhD. But again, you can get an excellent education in the U.S., but also in just about any other part of the world. So in the end, I think it's the decision of what is right for you in your personal life and in your professional goals, whether the U.S. is the right place for you to consider or not. It was a very good choice for me. Um, my life and my career is bigger and more interesting because I studied in the U.S. Okay, a little bit about the structure of the U.S. higher education system. So that's kind of the typical path of what an American student would take, right? In the U.S., a bachelor's degree is a four-year degree. And usually after students completed the four-year bachelor's degree, they might go off on this branch and do a professional degree. This is going to medical school or you go to law school. So that's usually an extra two to five years of study and you become a lawyer or a doctor. Or else students usually go directly from the four-year bachelor's degree into a five-year PhD. So most American students go directly from their undergrad into a PhD program. There are master's degrees in the U.S., but they are much less common than you find in many other places of the world. And you don't have to do a master's degree before you do a PhD. And most American students don't. They go straight from a bachelor's to a PhD. Um, it's possible to first do an MA, and international students often apply to the PhD program with a master's degree because in the rest of the world, master's degrees are more common. Now something to, to remember, take into account, is if you come with a master's degree, your PhD will still be five years. You don't get kind of a two-year discount for having done an MA. But MAs are not very common in the U.S. And we'll soon talk about funding. Another difference is in the United States, master's degrees are usually not funded. You have to pay for yourself. Whereas PhD degrees are usually funded, so you don't have to pay to be a PhD student. It's kind of one reason why Americans also avoid that PhD route. Okay, um, PhD programs are five years. This is kind of a typical structure of a PhD program. It's going to differ from field to field and department to department, but roughly speaking, the first two years of the PhD in the U.S. system is you're taking classes. In the first year, you might be taking introductory courses in each one of the sub-disciplines of your area of study. In the second year, you might be taking a few advanced courses, maybe a few research seminars. And then in the third year, our students usually write something that's similar to a master's thesis. It's called various different things at different universities, but a, a substantive piece of research writing. You might not get a master's degree for that, but you do kind of the same as what you might do in a master's degree. And then usually in the last two of the five years is when students focus on writing their dissertations, right? So five years, and that's roughly what it will look like you know, with some variation between different fields and different universities. But usually a few years of intensive, high-level classes, very thorough introduction in all the sub-disciplines, start specializing in your area, and then a thesis like a master's thesis, and then the PhD dissertation at the end. Let's talk about funding. Um, you should never do a PhD in the United States for which you pay yourself. It is way too expensive. Once you've paid tuition and rented an apartment to stay and bought books and food and medical insurance, it can cost up to half a million dollars or more in some of the big cities to do a PhD in the U.S. And if you're going to become a professor, you will probably be paying off on that for the rest of your life. Um, so you should not pay for a PhD yourself. Luckily, unlike for master's degrees where you have to pay yourself, at Virtually every university where you might want to get a PhD from in the U.S., it should be fully funded. So you're going to get a stipend, 
It differs from different universities, but typically between thirty and fifty thousand dollars. That's enough to rent an apartment, buy food, you know, if you live carefully, buy a plane ticket to come back home once a year. You can't live like a rich person, but you can live on that. And also the funding packages usually include, well, usually always include tuition waiver, so you won't have to pay tuition, health insurance, which is really important in the US, funding to support your research. It's going to differ from department to department, but usually you can assume there will be access to, you know, at least $20,000 to pay for research expenses related to the work. So the funding structure, if you can get admitted, is usually very good. So what kinds of funding is available? When you're admitted, you're going to get an admissions letter that will tell you, we've admitted you, it's a five-year program, here's your five-year funding package. It's composed of the following parts, right? But this is the typical kinds of funding that might be included. The fellowship. Those are the best ones to get because if you're on a fellowship, you can be a full-time student. You just get funding to be a student. You don't have to do work for that funding. Most PhD programs will admit their students with at least one year of fellowship funding. Usually you can get two years, sometimes three years of fellowship funding. It's often in the first year, so you can kind of adjust to the new system or towards the end when you want to focus on your dissertation. So fellowship funding is usually at the beginning and the end. The middle part of the PhD is more likely to be funded by some kind of assistantship. There's two main kinds of assistantship, teaching and research. If you're a teaching assistant, you might work together with a professor who's teaching a large undergraduate class, and you might hold office hours to meet with students, grade exams, teach smaller discussion sections. If you're a research assistant, you're going to work with a professor on their research, might be in a lab or you know, you might be doing some other work with a professor. These assistantships usually is around 15 to 20 hours of work a week, so it's about half your time, if 40 hours is a full-time job, half your time when you earn your income, you'll be working rather than focusing on your own studies. It's not bad to be an assistant because all the work you do there is relevant to your, if you are thinking of a job in academia, right? You teach, you do research, and that kind of builds also your profile as, a, as an academic by doing that work. There's also external fellowships not coming from the university. Very few of those are available for non-American students. If you're an American, you have access to more fellowship opportunities, but there are some fellowships that are specifically for international students, and it's absolutely worth looking for the ones that you might qualify for and applying for them because fellowship means more time to focus on your own work because you're not going to spend 15 hours a week doing a job. But your funding will probably be composed of some combination of these various kinds of funding. It won't be only one kind, or it will be various different bits where it's coming from, but usually for the full five years. Okay. Now let's talk about the application process. What the, you've decided you want to apply to a UHP, DP, US PhD program, what goes into it? Um, one thing to remember is if you're applying as an international student, it's definitely not going to count against you. As I said, it might count for you. American departments really value broadly diverse student body, so they're not, American universities do not admit their own undergraduate students into their PhD program. They, they just don't. So they actively look for students from other universities. And they want big and diverse cohorts, people with different experiences, different knowledge that they can contribute. Um, and specifically, universities that get a lot of international PhD students, that counts towards that university's stature, right? So applying as an international student is a good thing. It doesn't count against you. It, it actually counts kind of for you. At the same time, you have to remember that PhD application is really, really competitive in the U.S. Depending on the field, the exact rate of admission is going to differ. In some fields like um, chemistry and engineering, admissions rate is higher, right? So let's say 30 to 40 percent of applicants might be admitted in a chemistry department. In other fields, such as my own linguistics, the admission rate is very, very low. It can be 5% or even below 5% of everybody applying might get in. 
So you have to remember it's very competitive, so you have to make the best application you can. And even then, even if you're an excellent student, you might not succeed. It's just there's so many more people who apply than what there are spots. And one reason for this is that everybody is funded, right? So we can't admit people that we can't fund. And that means there's often many excellent students, but we just don't have the funding to admit them. Okay. Um, the American academic year runs from September to May. So the first semester is the fall semester from September to December, and the second semester is winter or spring. They call them different things at different universities. It goes usually from January to May, and then June, July, August, we are off, right? We are not in classes. And that's when we focus on research and go and do field work and things like that. So the application period for PhD programs, usually different universities have different deadlines, but usually the deadlines start kind of like late October into the first week of January. And you'll have to look at the universities you're applying to what their deadline is. So you might be submitting your application in November. Usually the decisions come out in February, middle to the end of February. So if you apply in November, you should hear middle February, end of February, whether your application was successful or not. And that will be for starting in September, right? So you apply about a year before you actually will start. So it's a long and drawn out process. Okay, what goes into an application? I'll briefly talk about all the different parts of the application process. And the first one is standardized tests. So, just about every American university is going to require of international students to pass some English language proficiency test. TOEFL is the most common one, and I'm sure every university accepts TOEFL. There's several other tests, but not all universities accept all of them. So again, look at where you're applying, which English proficiency test they require. Um, the TOEFL costs around $250 to complete, to, to register for, and it takes about two hours. You do it online. It's relatively easy. If you have been reading academic English, the TOEFL test is not going to be very difficult, right? There's two parts of it, the written part and the spoken part. And the written part is usually not very difficult for students who have anyway been reading academic English. The spoken part can be a bit more difficult. Right? If you're not used to speaking English, then the spoken part of the, these tests might be a bit more difficult. Um, so, you know, make sure you also speak English, because that's going to help you on the spoken part of the TOEFL. But you'll probably have to pass some kind of English proficiency test as part of your application. Then there's also the so-called GRE, or the Graduate Record Exam. It used to be that virtually all universities require this. Now I think maybe only about half do, but many, many still do. So again, you have to look whether the place you're applying to requires of you to take the GRE. The GRE is supposed to kind of equal the, the playing field, right? Because it's a general exam on general knowledge, verbal reasoning, basic mathematics, basic analytical reasoning. And the idea is now everybody takes this test and we can compare them equally. In reality, it doesn't quite work like that. American students usually do a lot better on the GRE because they have a lot of experience in doing these standardized tests. And international students often do less well, and that's one reason why most universities have decided not to use the GRE anymore, because they realize it's kind of culturally biased. But many still do, and therefore, if it's required by where you're applying, you have to also take the GRE. You can register at very many private companies that kind of train you to be successful at the GRE, and that's certainly a good thing. Those are usually quite expensive, these training courses. So you can also just go to the website of the company that runs the GRE and download practice exams, get their study guides, and you can probably study on your own. But if you're worried, you can always take a, you know, a private workshop that kind of prepares you for the GRE. I won't go through the different kinds of questions, but the link is on the slides that Dr. Lee will share. We can kind of download sample GRE exam to see what it's about. Um, okay, the personal essays. Whenever you apply, you're going to have to submit one or two or some universities, three different statements. Um, you know, and you'll have to look at your university whether, you know, how many different ones
ones they're asking for. They all contain the same information. It's just some universities you put it all in one essay and in some they will break it up into two or three separate essays. But most places will ask for one or two. And um, usually these statements are single spaced, each of them around two to three pages long. Four pages is okay, but you know, don't go much over four pages per statement because the admissions committee has to read hundreds or thousands of these, and if it's too long, they'll start getting annoyed. Right? So the two most common ones is the research statement and the personal statement. The research statement is the place where you will tell them what is your main area of interest, what is the main research questions you might want to pursue, um, what methods do you might want to use to you know, find answers to the questions you want to pursue. So that's where you tell them who you are, what your interests are. Right? Something to remember about these research statements, especially if you have like, experience in applying to, for instance, European PhD programs. If you apply to a European PhD program, your research statement is the proposal for the dissertation you want to write. And if they admit you, it's to write that dissertation. In the U.S., your research statement is not that. Very, very, very few people end up writing their dissertations about what they say in their research statement. If you think back to the structure, the first three years you're not yet going to work on your dissertation, right? So people kind of find their dissertation topics in those first three years in the PhD program. So you're not really writing here the research proposal for your dissertation. What you want to communicate to the admissions committee is you know what you're getting into, you know it's a research degree and you know what it means to do research, which means you can identify interesting research questions. You know what research means, so once you've identified the questions, you know what kind of data you need to answer those questions. And you have the necessary knowledge of the literature and the field that you can actually identify the questions and the methods necessary to find the answers, right? You want to convince them that you know how to be a researcher. That's the main goal you want to communicate here. Also, your research statement should be tailored to the place you're applying to, right? So if you think about thinking now about my department, we get 150 applications, we admit six to eight students, but there's more than six or eight students who's excellent and could do very well in our PhD program. So out of 150 applications, there's maybe 30 or 40 students, all of whom could do excellent at the PhD. How do we pick our six or eight that we admit? We look for those applicants whose stated research interests overlap significantly with the research interests of the professor in our department. So when you write your research statement, it has to be tailored to the department you're applying to. See what the professor in that department does research on and write your research statement to show that you share interests with them. And that means if you're applying to five or six different universities, your research statement might have to be slightly different for each place to show that the kind of match of research interests. So that's the research statement. Then many universities ask for a separate personal statement. Sometimes they don't, and if they don't, then this all gets folded into your one statement. So the personal statement is the only place where you have to tell them something about who you are. Um, it's important though not to get too personal, right? It's still a kind of professional statement. So the kinds of things you, you should take into account here is when we admit you into a PhD program, you are going to join our departmental community for five years. You're going to become a really important part of our community and there's a lot of interaction. So we look at, can you do the research? But we also ask, are you the kind of person that we want to be in our community? Are you going to contribute to the community, right? Are you going to participate in departmental activities? Are you going to do your share of, of you know, serving on committees and helping to organize speaker series and things like that? So in your personal statement is where you can talk about which student organizations were you involved in. You know, did you help to organize a talk series? Um, you know, so kind of tell us a little bit more about who you are and the kind of person you are, evidence that you are an engaged member of the communities that you participate in. This is also a place where you can address gaps or problems in your academic record, right? So very many times 
you had a semester where you didn't do well. Maybe you were sick or maybe there was a crisis in your family. Maybe you started out studying mathematics and then you did poorly in math and you realized you should really study international relations. So when you switched over to that, your grades improved. So this is a place where you can address things like that. Maybe you took a break in the middle of your studies to take care of an ailing parent. You can address those gaps in this personal statement. If you don't address them, we anyway see it in your record. And then we do a lot of kind of imagining of what happens. So this is your chance to set the narrative of how should we look at your profile. Um, right, so all of these are the kinds of things that can go into your personal statement. Okay, other things you have to include is transcripts, so this is, you know, a record of all the classes you've taken and the grades you've earned in them. Um, usually when you apply, it can be an unofficial transcript. If they admit you, they want to see an official transcript. Transcript, so it's good to start early on this, especially if the transcript is not going to be in English and you need to get an official translation done. It might take a while to get those, so make sure you start the process of getting your transcripts as early as possible. If the grading system in the country from which you apply is different from the U.S. grading system, it might also be good if there's information available about grade distribution, right? This many students get an A, this many students get a B, and so on. If that can be included, because it can help the admissions committee to understand how to evaluate your grades. That being said, if you're applying from a Japanese university, you probably don't have to worry about that too much because we get enough applications from Japanese universities in the U.S. that admissions committees kind of know how to read a Japanese transcript, right? If you apply from countries where we don't know the system well, then it's a little bit more difficult. Okay, another thing you have to include is the writing sample. That's a very, very, very important part of the application. We look at these very, very carefully. So what is the writing sample? It's going to be a sample of academic research writing that you have done. So if you've done an honors thesis, a final year thesis, it could be that. If you've written an MA thesis, it could be your MA thesis. But it can also be just a term paper, a research paper, or two research papers you wrote in an undergraduate class, right? What you want is a piece of academic writing that shows to the admissions committee that you can do academic writing. You know how to explain complex topics. You can maintain an argument over an extended document, right? You can kind of maintain the arc of the argument over a 20 to 40 page long document. Um, what we are looking for is evidence that you can do academic writing. That's what we look for because it is our goal to talk with our students about their ideas and not about how to write about their ideas. And because, you know, we get 150 applications for six or seven positions, it means we can go and select those students who we know can do good academic writing. So that's what you want to communicate in your writing sample. The primary goal is you can do academic writing. You can maintain an argument over a long document. It's good if it is on the topic that you say you might want to do research on, right? But that is not absolutely required. And sometimes in linguistics, we get students applying who haven't done linguistics as an undergrad, who did psychology or who did literature, and their writing samples might be psychology or literature. As long as it shows they can do academic writing, they can do academic reasoning, then it's still okay. So the writing sample is really important. We read them very, very closely. Make sure that you polish them, that they're as good as they can be, that you really show you can do academic writing. Um, recommendation, well, recommendation language, right? I'm running through this faster than I thought you, so there will be lots of time for questions. Recommendation language. Usually, you will have to get at least three recommendation letters. Um, the people writing them won't, giving them won't be giving them to you. Usually they will get an email from the university with the link to upload the recommendation letters. Um, you can, in the U.S., 
you know, ticker box to say I waive the right to access my recommendation letters, which means they're anonymous. Well, you don't see them, only the application committee see them. Or you can tick a box to say you want to see the letters. And it's really okay to do either, although I think the vast majority of people tick the box to waive the right to access, which means you don't see what your professors write about you. But you have the right, you can tick the box to say you want to see it. You won't see it before they submit it, but you might see it after they submit it. Usually people tick the box to say I waive the right. That's the most common approach. You want the recommendation letters to come from people who are familiar with your ability as a researcher. So you want it to come from your thesis advisor, a professor you were a research assistant for, a professor for whom you, you know, wrote a good term paper in a class you took from that professor. That's the kind of person who's going to write you the best recommendation letter. Because it's not a character letter, right? We're not asking the external letter writers to tell us if you're a good person. We're asking them, does this person have the ability to do research? Does this person have the ability to succeed in a PhD program? So when you think about who to ask, Ask the people who can talk about your abilities as a researcher. So, it's with, for instance, better to get three letters from professors familiar with your work than two letters from a professor and one from, say, an employer for whom you worked. Right? The employer can say, you're a responsible worker, but cannot talk about your abilities as a researcher. So, if you can, get three from professors. Sometimes, if you've done, you know, work, somewhere in your life, it's okay to get one from an employer, but just remember that letter is going to have less weight because they can't talk about your abilities as a researcher. So if you can, get from professors to write you the letters. And writing these letters is a lot of work, so make it as easy as possible on your letter writers, which also means they can write you these better letters. If you're applying to you know, five or ten different PhD programs, which you might want to, given the low admissions rate. You know, create a spreadsheet where you list all the schools you're applying to, when the deadline of the letter submissions is for each one, um, how do they submit them, do they get a link, is it by email, so that I have all the information available to them. Give them all your writing samples, your research statements, so that they can see what you are saying about yourself. And that makes it possible for your letter writers to write a letter that kind of tells the same story as what you are telling. And also give them as much time as you can. Right? So if the deadline is November 15, give this information to your letter writers October 15, so that they have a good month to, to make as good a letter as possible. And all of this means you probably have to start much earlier than the deadline to prepare your applications. Okay, that is kind of what goes into the application process. Now you've applied and February has come around and you've gotten an email and the email might say congratulations, we would like to admit you into our PhD program, you know, go out and celebrate, be happy, it's a great day in your life. But it might also be, sorry we were not able to admit you. That's going to happen given the low rate of admissions, given the competitive nature of admissions. So if that happens, a couple of things to remember. Your worth as a human being is not connected to your ability to be admitted to a PhD program in the US. Your worth as a researcher is not connected to your ability to be admitted into a PhD program in the US. If you think about, think about my department where we admit six or seven students out of 150 applications. That means there's probably another 30 students who could have done just as well. And the reason that you might not have been admitted might not be because you were less good, but it might be because the professor with whom you would have been working already has too many PhD students. Or the funding that we have available is for students from, you know, Africa and not for students from Asia and therefore we admitted somebody from Nigeria and not somebody from Japan. So not being successful doesn't necessarily mean your application wasn't good. There's a lot of kind of luck involved also in the process. So if you were not successful, 
you know, it's a time to reassess and think, maybe, maybe I apply again next year. Many students apply more than once. Of course, it costs money every time to apply, so you have to think about the cost. Or maybe if you think about where we started, there are good universities everywhere in the world, including right here in Japan. And you can get an excellent education right here. Right? You don't have to go to the US. Okay, 33 minutes. I will stop here and then I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the floor is open and I think you learned a lot. This is the basic thing. I attest that I went through the same process. <laughs> so, and uh, things change, but uh, it doesn't, they don't change drastically. So it's fairly similar. Uh, many things that changed is uh, when I applied 20 years ago, I had to use EMS to send all the applications to the universities with a registered check. Mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. But now you can pay with a credit card, you, you can submit it online. Yeah. That's a huge difference and makes it easier to apply. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's not inexpensive to apply, right? If you have to do TOEFL and the GRE, right. that's around $500. And, and every university you apply to will have an application fee. And they range between $100 and $200 or $300, right? So, and and given the low admissions rate, most students apply to five to ten different universities. So it can cost a few thousand dollars to apply. It's unfortunately not inexpensive. Right. So I started talking because I wanted to give you time to think about questions. And also in the meantime, I, I sent you all an email with uh, a link to questions and also uh, a comment sheet of Google Form you can ask questions and also a link to a folder where these uh, uh, slides are contained. And the link to the folder will be active for some time. Uh, so when we have questions, uh, we will also add the questions there so you can see what your uh, peers have asked uh, related to the rest. Does anyone have a question? Yeah. Then uh, let's maybe begin with a very simple question regarding English text. Do not many universities accept the IELTS score as a measure? Yeah. So, so TOEFL is the most widely accepted one. IELTS is also very widely accepted, but not every place will accept it. It is, you know, it would be great if all the universities accepted exactly the same tests. But you will just have to look at every individual university, what they accept and what not. TOEFL is the oldest one, and I think therefore virtually everybody accepts TOEFL. But IELTS is very common also. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Now, when should we start to think about funding and the of the When you should start thinking about funding. You really don't, if your plan is to do a PhD, you really don't have to think about funding. Because it, virtually all major American universities will admit you with funding. So the funding comes automatically together with the admissions. Usually you don't even apply for the funding. It's usually just included. I say usually, right? There are universities that do them separately where you apply for admissions to the PhD program and there's a separate funding application, but virtually all major American universities fund their PhD students as a matter of course. If you're applying to smaller universities or universities that somewhat lower down on the ranking, so those are often universities with less funding, they might admit students without funding and then students have to do the work of finding the funding. Um, that, if you can, I would, if you can, I would say avoid that and apply to places that fund all their PhD students. Most major universities do. If you go to a professional school, so medical school or law school, that's without funding. Then you have to pay for yourself. If you apply to a master's program, they are nearly all without funding. You have to pay for yourself. 
but most PhD programs will include, when they admit you, you will be admitted with funding. At what point should you be certain that? Well, since the application, so when, when, you, when should you be certain that you want to apply to grad school? Since the application deadlines, you know, the earliest ones are typically kind of at the end of October. And since putting together all your application materials is probably going to take you at least a month of hard work, and since you want to allow your letter writer, say, at least a month to write your letters, then, you know, you need to be working on your application materials in September, early October, to allow people enough time to prepare that. Um, but you're, you're also kind of, kind of asking a, maybe a different question, and that is like, you know, there's all these things that you need a writing sample, right? So you need to make sure that by the time you're applying, you have a good writing sample. So sometimes that might mean in your third year as an undergraduate, you need to think, I want to apply to a graduate school next year. So I need to be working on a thesis now, or this term paper I'm writing for this class, I should put more effort into it, because this might be the one that will, I will use as my writing sample. And what, what sometimes happens is that students you know, write an honors thesis in the fourth year of their undergraduate, but, you know, that fourth year might, the academic year might end in April and the application might close in October, so you might not have finished your thesis by the time that the application period happens. And sometimes that unfortunately means that students have to wait a year before they apply to have a good writing sample. And then you might have a year in the middle of you need to do something with that year in the middle. Um, so sometimes it helps if you can do a little bit further planning into the future and think, you know, I want to apply to grad school, what do I have to do to make sure I'm ready to apply when the application deadline comes? Um, yeah. Yes. So I'm familiar with like applying to schools for undergrad in the US and when you apply for undergrad you have like safety schools, read schools and target schools. So how does this like translate over to applying for a master's? Like, is it similar? So I know for a master's it's more about like what you want to do and you pick a school based on if it matches your like research interests and stuff like that. So how does that work when you apply for a master's? Yeah, I don't know if the Japanese system has the kind of like target schools and safety schools, but in the U.S., when you apply as an undergrad, right, you like also apply to many different universities because also there the admissions process is quite competitive. But say you want to go to the I don't know University of Michigan, um, which is one of the good universities in the U.S. with even undergraduate admission is fairly competitive. So you might want to go there or Harvard or Yale but you know your chances are small. So you apply there, and then you apply to a host, a whole bunch of universities that's still good, but slightly lower. And those are your safety schools, your chances are better of getting in. That's not really such a big thing when you apply to graduate programs, both masters and PhDs. Because then it's less to do with the university and more with the specific department less with the university and more with the professors you might want to work with at the department. So a good example, I did my PhD at University of Massachusetts. It is not as a university a top tier university, right? In the state of Massachusetts you have Harvard and MIT, those are the prestigious universities. The university of Massachusetts is a good university but not a top tier university. Their linguistics department is a top of linguistics department, right? So as an undergrad, you might apply to go to Harvard, but if you want to do a PhD in linguistics, it's better to go to UMass than to Harvard. So when you're applying to graduate programs, it's more important to look at what is your research interests, what are the research interests of the people at that university, and it's more important to look at the department than at the university as a whole to ask, is this a department with a good standing in the field? Even so, you know, admissions are very competitive 
So you might want to study at the University of Massachusetts, like I did, as a linguist, and you might realize that the chances of admission there is like two or three percent. So you're going to apply to ten PhD programs, and maybe some of the others are ones where you think, I could fit in there, but really I want to go to UMass. So you kind of also have safety schools, but it's, it's, it's not quite the same as at the undergrad level. Would you, would you say there are safety programs and target programs rather than target school safety schools? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's not school based, it's department based. Maybe one of the questions that Japanese students might have is how much of the English school is the determining factor for entering or getting accepted yeah. in a US based uh, program? Mm -hmm. If it's less than perfect. Yeah. yeah. So universities will have for each one of these English proficiency tests, whether it's TOEFL or IELTS or any of these, if you look at the graduate school webpage, right? So the graduate school is the school that does all the PhD and master's students. They will publish minimum scores that you need to meet in each one of these English proficiency tests. And as long as you meet the minimum score, that box is ticked, right? So you don't get special points for being very far above the minimum score. You need to meet, it's an eligibility check. It's like, have you met the minimum score? Yes. From that point onwards, we don't look at your English proficiency test. We only look at the rest of the application. Have you not met the minimum score, we don't look at your application at all. So it's an eligibility test. And as long as you meet that minimum standard, then you've met that requirement. Um, some universities, not University of Michigan, some will do things like, you know, you haven't met the minimum, but you were close, that they will offer you provisional admissions with the requirement that you say take an English class in the next six months and retake the test. But there's very, very few that do that. Usually, usually we get so many applications that we can just say, well, thank heavens, these 10 people didn't meet the minimum requirement, so it's 10 fewer we have to read. So usually if you don't make the minimum requirement, you can't even submit your application. It's kind of an eligibility. Other questions? Yes. Okay, so thank you for answering my last, my last question. So my next question is about recommendation letters. So let's say I'm doing an internship at like a top company, and the company is like really directed to like my major and the mm -hmm. studies and what I want to do, like the research field. Mm -hmm. If I got a recommendation letter from like a mentor at my internship, does that work, or is it better to get one from a professor? No. In a case like that, I think it's really good to get that recommendation. Right? If you do an internship that is thematically related to your area of study, that's going to actually boost your application, right? Because it's showing that, yes, you have the academic credentials, but you've also applied that. So that would be a good letter. But then I would say the other two better come from professors, right? Because we want to still have people to speak about your abilities as a student and a researcher. If you are studying psychology and you work part-time as a clerk in a store, you don't want a letter of recommendation from your supervisor then because it's just not relevant to your, to your study, right? Um, if you're applying to a linguistics PhD program and you were teaching English in Japan as an American student, you might want to get a letter of your supervisor at your English school because it's relevant to your application. But I would say at most one letter from a non-professor, no, no more than that, because we really want the professor to talk about your ability as a, as a re more your abilities as a researcher than the abilities as a student, right? So you, you don't only want to ask a professor with whom you've taken a large undergraduate class in which you didn't write any research papers, because they can't talk about can you do research. So you want to ask professors who you take classes with as a senior, and you were involved in it, some kind of research. Connected to the recommendation letter question, uh, because many of the students are in Japan, and some professors are not familiar with the recommendation letter writing practices, mm -hmm. and 
in Europe, for example, they would have written, I recommend this to one line. Yeah. But that's not really what uh, USC universities are looking for. So what would be the strategy that students can take yeah. if they know the professor is not familiar with the university? American letters of recommendation, both when you're applying to graduate school, when you're applying to a job, are long and elaborate and effusive in praise. So virtually, virtually every recommendation letter is going to say, this is an excellent student and the student has done great work for me and here's examples of the great work the student has done. What that means is our job as the admissions committee is really difficult because in America everybody is good. So how do you find the really good amongst everybody that is good? American professors know that, right? So when they really want to indicate that this is a, this is a really good candidate, they can go kind of over the top with the recommendation letter. But letters we get from Asia and Africa and Europe are shorter and much less effusive in print. So, if you want to, you can share these links with the people when you ask them to write your recommendation letters. That's just two examples of the many, many places on the web where there are examples of what a good recommendation letter in America looks like, some hints about how to write a good recommendation letter, um, and it can be really helpful for non-American professors if they can see what that looks like. I know it's not always possible, right? Sometimes you just don't have that kind of relationship with your professors to tell them, um, Professor Lee, please don't write me a Japanese style letter, write me an American style letter, here is how to do it. And it can be difficult to tell your professor that. So, it, if you can't do that, it's probably okay. Admissions committees who read thousands of recommendation letters and who have been doing it often for many, many years know that there's different styles of these letters. And they can often say, okay, we put this letter from, you know, professor at University of California, Los Angeles, next to this letter from professor of University of Tokyo. and." You know, the UCLA letter is four pages long and contains every adjective that is positive in the English language. The letter from Tokyo is one page long that says it's a good student. And often we can put them next to another and say they're both really positive letters because we know they are different styles. That being said, if you have the kind of relationship with your professor that you can tell them this is an American university, send them links like this so that they can kind of see, you know, American recommendation letters are over the top. Right, if I, if I think about the recommendation letters that I received and wrote when I lived and worked in South Africa, a recommendation letters there is basically, I, I, I can't find any negative in the student's record. And therefore I recommend that you admit them. Right? <laughs> And in the American system, a letter like that would be like, there's serious problems here, right? And in the South African system, that means it's a good student, admit them. So there are very different styles of writing these letters. A, a good thing to do, speaking about letters, since even, as I say, usually people tick the box to say, I don't want to see the letter. And maybe that's good because you don't have to know what people say about you. Even if you tick the box to say, I want to see the letter, you only see it after they've submitted it. So you don't know what they are going to write about you. So it might be good when you ask somebody to write a letter to say, can you write a letter for me that is positive? And if they say no, then, don't, then ask somebody else, right? So it, you, you want to make sure that people you ask are people who are going to say good things about you. Yes? Uh, 
So, you know, Southeast Asia or South Asia, are you from Pakistan, India? Bangladesh. Bangladesh, right? And that's going to be very similar in the UK. It's going to be very similar in the South African system. The distance between the social distance between the student and the professor is very, very large. And you just can't have this kind of conversation with your professor. Don't worry about it. Admissions committees have experience with the fact that there's different styles. So if you can't have this conversation with your professor, make sure the rest of your application is as good as it can be. Right? We, we can read the letters in the context of the student's profile. Yes. So if you go to the States with your partner or let's say with your family, if you have children, does that affect your chances of being successful at the application? The short answer is no, right? It is against the law in America to take into consideration family situation for things like admissions or for job applications, right? You just can't. That information isn't even included in your application unless you talk about your family in your personal essay, they wouldn't know whether you are married or have children. U.S. curriculum vitae also don't contain such personal information. It doesn't say when you were born, whether you were married, it's just not included. So it's not relevant to the work environment and therefore we don't look at it. So for admissions, it's not going to be a problem. It might become a problem for funding because the funding that you will receive from the university will be enough funding for one person. And to get a visa, you need to show the U.S. government that you have enough money such that you wouldn't have to work outside of the university. Because as a non-American, you are not allowed to take a job outside the university where you're a student to support yourself. And the funding that you get from the university will be enough that you can convince the embassy that you as a single person will have enough money. So if you go to apply for your visa, and you say, yes, my letter from University of Michigan that says I get a stipend of $45,000 a year, but I have my husband and two children with me, they won't give you a visa because that's not going to be enough funding for three people. So it's not about the admission, that's the question. It's about the funding and getting the visa at the U.S. Embassy. That's where you might run into problems if you have a family that's coming with you. Then you'll need to find another way to show sufficient funds to support them. Most students are admitted on, you know, get a so-called F visa, that's a student visa. And the F visa allows you as the student to be a student and to work on campus, to be a research assistant or a teaching assistant, work related to your education. The F visa does not allow you to take a job off campus. And your spouse will get a so-called F2 visa. The student is F1, F2 is the spouse and the children. And the F2 visa does not allow any work. If you're on an F2 visa, you are not allowed to take any work in the US. Which means your spouse wouldn't be allowed to work. So you will need to have enough personal funds to support your spouse or children. There is one other option, the J visa. So J is usually for visiting scholars, not for students. You can't usually get a degree on a J visa. Sometimes it is possible under special circumstances to go onto a J visa even if you're a student. And then you will be the J1. It means you can study and work on campus. And your spouse will be a J2 and the J2 can work. So if you can get a J visa, then your spouse can work. But J visas are more difficult to get. The university has to do a lot more work to get a J visa, and sometimes they just don't want to do it. There's one other thing about the J visa that is good to remember. If you're on an F visa, a student visa, and you finish your degree, you can apply for a job in the U.S. and take that job. If you're on a J visa, Virtually all people on a J visa has a two-year home residency requirement. What that means is once you finish your degree, you need to return to your home country for two years 
and only after two years can you apply for a job in the U.S. So the J visa is complicated for many reasons. Let's end the official part of the program here. Let us thank. Uh, thank you. And.